Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hong Phu Tang. I am a board member of the Open Source Business Alliance Europe. I act as the vice president of the Open Source Initiative and uh, I am the founder of uh, Force Asia, an organization that fosters free and open source movement in Asia. You probably heard of um, the Force Asia Summit, uh, which takes place uh, in March every year right after FOSDEM. But many of you might not know that we actually release uh, quite a, a number of open source software and hardware projects. We have a stand here at FOSDEM in the hardware cluster in case you want to check out our work. Um, by the way, I'm calling in from Berlin, Germany. I could not get back to Asia since April because of uh, the pandemic. Of course, it's a very challenging time for, for all of us. I'm still glad that we are able to meet and connect virtually. And today I'm here together with Dev Nicholson. She is the general manager at Open Source Initiative. She has 15 years of experience in false licenses and policies. She also the founder of uh, GNU Linux Conference in Seattle. And uh, Deb is calling in from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hello, Deb. Hi, Hong Fu. It's great Hi. to be here. Great, great <laughs> to see you. <laughs> shall yeah. We, um, shall we start We're going to talk. Yeah, so we wanted to talk about how uh, open source culture is uh, pretty US centric, but maybe it shouldn't be. And then maybe go into um, some of the ways that we can make the like the big picture conversations a little bit more global and inclusive. Uh, the reason we thought of it is that uh, OSI is working to be a global and inclusive organization, but we sometimes struggle to find a way to uh, engage both U.S. folks and non-U.S. folks. Sometimes the uh, challenges and problems are different, but sometimes they're pretty similar. So we wanted to look at, uh, you know, how we could improve that. And we also wanted to look at uh, like why a lot of the conversations seem to center the U.S. We know that a lot of the like big tech companies are from the U.S. originally, uh, like Microsoft and Facebook and Google and Amazon, um, but also even a lot of like the big uh, kind of old school open source projects, like um, you know a lot of the. Uh, uh, Debian and Fedora developers are based in the U.S., Red Hat's from the U.S., things like that. So, um, But we know that there are contributors all over the world to open source. You can see here that only 28% of FOSS contributors are based in the U.S., while 53% are based in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, and this is from a recent study by the Linux Foundation. So um, a little skewed towards their community, but still really telling numbers around, like, who is really participating in building open source around the world. So um, I guess, Hang Fook, if you wanted to talk about like why we care who participates in the conversation around open source policy, I'll hand it back to you. So open source only happened because of the global collaboration of people from everywhere around the world. So uh, the software that we use these days is not uh, uh, only developed by the people from uh, one region, but from the people of everywhere. So if the, the software that we use being developed by um, people around the world, why the conversation on policies is not uh, inclusive for, for all the um, by contributors, everywhere yeah so i think that uh, open source is stronger when it's truly global and uh, truly a global community gives a wealth to um of different perspectives and help us to build software that is um, accessible to to more people yeah and you kind of pointed out to me that it can be a little annoying when people get together on a supposedly global conversation but then they end up just talking about us stuff uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's also, yeah, you know, Deb, um, yeah, so uh, we uh, we meet at uh, um, like regularly uh, because of the work of the Open Source Initiative. We also met at like different conferences, right? But, but uh, you see a um, majority of the speakers are come from the U.S. And if we have like group discussion, you can see that a lot of actors, participants are coming from, from these regions. And uh, of course, uh, there's uh, the conversation around how can we be more inclusive uh, to communities 
um, in different regions is always a big topic and of course it is important that we um, discuss and uh, and and, uh, and find out how we can, uh, can what we can do to improve yeah yeah I, and I think it's especially important here in the policy track because uh, a lot of the best ideas around adoption of open source aren't coming from the US so like the state of uh, like free and open source software adoption is pretty different in different places. And, um, you know, the, the challenges to building and pushing for open source use vary, but we could share a lot more ideas. There are definitely um, strategies that we see for, uh, you know, pushing to get more open source adoption in different places that um, could be tried in a lot more places. So um, yeah. I, I guess, I also sort of feel like it, it feels like unfair that because like um, we end up uh, we end up taking a lot of cues from uh, users from really wealthy nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if if like free and open source software is this force for good in the world, then everyone has to be able to participate in the conversations about the future of technology. And there's still a lot that open source can do to serve like minority language groups or vulnerable populations or um, economies that don't look like the economy in the US. And so I'd really love to see us, um, you know, kind of get to work on how we could uh, help each other include our policy approaches. Uh, and that's kind of the reason we wanted to make this conversation more global. Uh, so I guess now we're going to talk a little bit about the state of open source policy work. Yeah, so I think that is a, a good uh, uh, next point for discussion. Yeah, so I think that, um, uh, yeah, so I think we can now talk a little bit on um, examples uh, that we have seen like, in places outside the US uh, around like open source policy. Um, yeah. Deb, do you yeah. want to, as you have so many experiences in the <laughs> in policy, oh. do you want to um, um, first? Yeah, I'll start with them. Um, and then, uh, and I, I know you have some too. Uh, in my uh, in my previous work at the Open Invention Network, I looked uh, pretty deeply into software patent policy. Um, software patents uh, create kind of this chilling effect on sharing and collaborating on software. And... Uh, you know, and in the U.S., like, you know, there's like you can buy a T-shirt that says, like, I hate patent trolls and stuff like that. And um, so there's definitely a lot of like we should do something about it. But then when you go to like New Zealand, they just kind of made it so that uh, most software isn't patentable there. Um, part of that's because New Zealand's a little smaller than even its neighbor, Australia or uh, or the U.S. But, uh, you know, they decided to start lobbying to uh, take software out of the scope of patentability and and they were successful and India's done uh, a similar like where they've they didn't really have a culture of patenting there but uh, there's definitely been some pressure to consider adopting like a US scope of patentability or a European scope of patentability um, and they've resisted that uh, because um, I think it would be harmful to their home grown uh, local open source industries, especially like the cheap smartphones. So, uh, and then once, you know, once they took that stand on like, no, we're not going to accept the kind of the European uh, scope of patentability, uh, their open source projects, their open source culture really started to flourish. And so India has just in the last couple of years decided that they're going to prefer open source a little bit like you have to um, when you're doing government procurement you have to say here are the open source options and um, if you want to use something proprietary you have to make a case for why the open source uh, option isn't good enough and so um, you know as, as far as like uh, procurement and I know that FSFE has been working on um, public money co public code but uh, it's already happening in India, but I think they're not even the first ones to do that. Are they, Hong Fook? Uh, when we talk about like um, earliest adopter of free software in Asia, so um, I believe it is probably Taiwan. Yeah, back in the in the nineties, when uh, new uh, utilities were introduced in uh, university campus across uh, Taiwan, and uh, 
it uh, led to the creation of the Chinese Linux uh, extension, CLE. Uh, this project was um, created in 1997. Uh, this is also the most referenced Linux environment in Taiwan. And then later, they also developed something called LXDE, another uh, like lightweight desktop environment. Um, and um, uh, in Taiwan, right, um, uh, in the early 2000s, the government introduced the national strategy on um, open source software to promote a nationwide ut utilization of uh, free software um, in, um, uh, in high school. And they also um, uh, like, uh, consider free software as an alternative for government procurement act, similar to what you mentioned in India before. Mm. And uh, from uh, the other like government uh, agency, uh, they form a Linux promotion task force um, where they also do a lot of uh, promotion in um, open source educa education and, and more. And until today, uh, Taiwan has a very healthy and active um, uh, free and open source uh, ecosystem, I believe. So they have a very well um, oh, yeah. uh, uh, like connection among different uh, actors like government, uh, academy, industries, and, and communities. And, uh, you know, uh, so there's, uh, I also in the post-racial community, there's so many um, uh, members uh, from uh, uh, from Taiwan, they, they're doing very good work and they also focus a lot uh, these days on um, open hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, example is, uh, 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 is about China, right? So in the recent years, we have seen uh, like tech giants like Huawei, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, they have contributed significant open source code around um, like cloud infrastructure. You can see, you can see on on GitHub, you can check out like yeah. um, the, like the top contributors have actually come from this company. Uh, they also released mm -hmm. a lot of code around uh, machine uh, learning. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like on the uh, government level, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology of China mm -hmm. has, uh, in the recent years, has uh, officially embraced uh, open source, especially in the context of uh, cloud computing, big data, mm -hmm. and AI. Of course, uh, we can uh, like uh, recognize that it's come from like the influence of the big companies of China. But another um, uh, reason was the um, U.S. and China trade uh, war, right? So um, it's pushed into the acceler acceleration of uh, China adoption of open source because they want to be independent from from the US uh, vendors. So, um, and uh, this also adding to the fact that uh, open source uh, become more and more um, uh, uh, like popular in, in China. And- um, Can I just say that that's so interesting because a lot of what drives uh, free software adoption in South America is also a desire to be independent from US companies. Yeah, so in, in, in China, we know already, so they, they, they have a huge market and um, uh, the idea of being a self-reliant uh, uh, nation is always there from the start of China. So, yeah, yeah. so it's important for them to to um, uh, to be independent and they recognize open source as a foundation for, in, for, for innovate new ideas and solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could say I could share another example from uh, from Singapore. Oh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, so um, Singapore, the open source adoption is actually in line with the the Singapore's smart nation vision. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, so for many years, there is the, the vision of Singapore to become a smart nation of the region, and uh, the government actually um, uh, tried to push a number of initiatives um, to highlight. And there is and that um, uh, GovTech, which is the government technology agency of Singapore, mm. uh, for example, in 2011, uh, they launched a government uh, one-stop data, data portal that released um, a lot of uh, like public uh, data sets uh, to the citizen from around 70 uh, government agencies 
So the whole idea is to uh, to to encourage uh, to encourage developers and, and industry to to build application based on government's open data. Also, in uh, 2017, GovTech uh, released uh, BLI uh, uh, under open source license. So BLI is a um, government uh, mobility platform, and it was really a big step forward, like um, adopting open source by engaging the community to contribute to a government platform. And most recently, uh, they also released the the Singapore Trace Together application open source. So this is um, uh, a COVID uh, contact tracing app. Yeah, and uh, and it's really uh, um, um, like great to see how government actually um, want to engage uh, more citizen and um, and the community into uh, like um, national solutions. Wow! Wow! Yeah, um, it's it's interesting here with the government side because there's also a lot of activity on the non governmental side in a lot of different places too. Um, so um, I would love to like highlight the Digital Impact Alliance, which is working on uh, you know advancing digital inclusion in a lot of uh, uh, what folks call like underdeveloped nations where the economy isn't so great, uh, and they're working really hard to make um, open source platforms like the building block for creating mm -hmm. businesses and uh, and adding like specific localized values so that those uh, communities, you know, they have their own code, they have their own software, It's and it's built on open source. No one's ever going to be able to take it away as a way to sort of uh, empower folks in those different regions. Um, so that's like, like the NGO uh, kind of presence, uh, a lot of that is in Africa. Um, there are some other places in South America, which we touched on. Um, and then the other thing that I think is super interesting, and this usually comes um, not from like a big player in the NGO space, like the United Nations, um, which is where the Digital Impact Alliance is held, but um, there are like a lot of smaller, more localized initiatives in the digital public goods area where, uh, you know, there's a chapter in India, there's a chapter in Norway, there's uh, work happening in Sierra Leone, and they're looking at uh, preferring uh, open source software solutions for like specific localized problems. And of course, like every city, when you live there, it's, a, it, it's different, it's special, but it definitely has things that it mm -hmm. shares with other cities. So, um, you know, part of forming alliances across like these different like non-governmental organization uh kind of initiatives is so that they can share and reuse and you know kind of borrow strategies from each other so it's a really uh good framework if you if that's the specific thing that you're trying to get done so um it just it's uh there's so much exciting stuff um yes. Exactly. There's so many examples of people doing like open source policy around the world, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't seem to be doing as much uh, learning from each other as we could. Yeah. Mm. Um, I wonder. So some of this um, could be because people are used to their own area. So they are even like their own purpose and some might like so um uh, like used to the way um uh, like we uh, communicate and we like frame our conversation yeah mm -hmm. and uh, i think that uh, the goal of uh, our uh, conversation so basically to um to discuss a few ideas how we could do better and we would also love to hear from uh from the audience to hear from uh, people participate in Fosdom, their suggestions, how we can make like, open source policy more inclusive. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really exciting. Um, and it's, uh, I think like one place that would be easiest maybe for folks to start is to make sure your existing open source communities really represent all your stakeholders and not just where your home office is or where your founders are. And that means choosing meeting times that might be a little less convenient for your US people, mm -hmm. um, but are better for like a wider range of time zones. Or you can kind of rotate through so that everyone, uh, each region gets a turn being at the really uh, kind of awkward time in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also make sure that um, 
all of your important conversations or decisions are captured in an asynchronous way so that everyone can come back and see like what the conversation was while they were asleep on their side of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, that's like one thing that I think um, would help communities start to push more of a global conversation. Yeah. Yes, and uh, yes, so uh, you said uh, about uh, how to make uh, uh, meeting participation more convenient for people outside of the US. So we also need to highlight the um, big elephant effect. So when we are in the conversation uh, that engage like uh, companies, um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 like international company, right? So, so um, it's more about, okay, so uh, let's the big elephant in the room speak and we listen yeah but i mm. think that, uh, in terms of learning and sharing it no matter uh where you are uh, you form a small or big project there's always something that we all can can learn from uh, of course uh, it, it's not to say that a big company do, do not have something to contribute of course they have a lot to, to, to contribute we want to learn from them but we also want to give a chance to 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 small and medium business uh, to understand the way they do open source in their region and also for smaller open source project how they engage um, uh, their community I, I believe that at the end uh, each of us can always like learn something from uh, from, from from each other yeah I, and I think it's it's so interesting because the way the companies from the US and the tech and culture interact is really different uh, than it is in some other places. And uh, an example that I want to share is that, um, you know, in the diversity work that I've done, diversity in the U.S. is largely focused on including women. And it has just started to get a, a little uh, better about looking at some other places where we can mm -hmm. improve diversity. But um, in India, the diversity challenge is not gender so much as it is caste. And so when people meet to talk about diversity, this, you know, uh, interests that we all share, the solutions that work in one place don't even always address the challenges in another place. And so um, it's, uh, and, and it's possible that, you know, by talking about cast in uh, and as a diversity element, it might lead us back to the US to talk about like class as a diversity element. And so I think, um, you know, the the focus can, uh, you know, where our folks are focused is a little bit different, but that we can still learn a lot from each other's approaches. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so I I can only second that I think like absolutely uh, like try what 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 you uh, said in your example right so um, the challenge is different from like many parts of the world and we cannot uh, uh, like only how do you say to to transfer what do we be, believe to other communities mm. yes and another thing that uh, to uh, um, uh, to make space to make space for people that uh, are not uh, uh, that you are not familiar with yeah so 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 for for uh, for, for example welcome speakers that are not regular at first time <laughs> which is easier during the pandemic than it's ever exactly. been before <laughs> yes exactly and though it's sad we cannot uh, connect in person it is opportunities for us um to connect to people who otherwise will will, will be very difficult to um uh, to to be here with us yeah and yeah, uh, yeah so so i think that is uh, one of the good side that we have because of covid right mm -hmm. um it's a great opportunity to reach out to to other uh, communities and uh, yeah yes. i think you were going to say sometimes that can be tricky though because um if you if you do present somewhere uh, outside your region you have to be careful about some of the shorthands and some of the um, like abbreviations that you use because uh, it's they might not be understood. So if your example relies on a really local experience, then you'll have to explain it to the whole room uh, mm -hmm. so they can understand your reference. Um, I would say another thing is that uh, when you're looking at, you know, like a, a policy effort or uh, you want to change something where you live, uh, look at the other countries where they've been successful in making that change and reach out before you um, 
build something from scratch, right? I mean, that's kind of the open source way, right? Uh, be open minded and uh, use other people's work when uh, when it's offered. Um, yeah. So, so like, yeah, yeah, and it's uh, like the policy campaigns we were talking about before, mm -hmm. um, especially like some of the work you're talking about. Like, it seems like Taiwan is like 20 years ahead of what people are just starting to talk about in the U.S. Like, you know, pushing for government open source adoption and teaching open source in schools. Um, and I think you know we can learn a lot from each other's mistakes and successes. And U.S. policymakers could learn a lot from. Uh, not just Taiwan, but also like India and New Zealand and some of the other places where uh, they've chosen to uh, kind of help open source succeed as opposed to um, put roadblocks up. Yeah, definitely. But I also want to highlight one challenge. So because of the language barrier, right? So sometimes mm -hmm. in different like like country in Asia or Africa, uh, they are doing good work, but they are not so like uh, uh, accessible to uh, to to the world, you know, because they've written their documentation or they they written their policy in their national language. So in order like to to, to understand and and to aware of what going on, of course, like usually like the communities that you have so every open source project, so uh, that like, they have like community members and contributors from everywhere. So try to use them as your resources. Try to use them as the door to enter like um, different country to learn from uh, for, from different nation and then they can support you to to, to find the right um, uh, information or the, the right uh, lesson from from their countries yeah yeah um, the other thing and I would say is I for... think we are like running out of time soon <laughs> yeah um, I think we we're just gonna say like uh, yeah, encourage uh, your, your, you know, plug into the networks that you already have within your project. Mm -hmm. You might find that there's a global, you know, pile of uh, meetups in your, you know, programming language space and uh, and keep looking for amazing events like FOSS Asia and FOSDEM uh, to participate in. And then, uh, oh, and we would love to have you join us with the OSI affiliate program, which is a global project. So. Yes. Thank you. We'll take a couple questions. Yeah, with that, we're going to end our uh, session here. And if Dev said, we're happy to take some questions. Okay.